soon it will be too late for you. You sound so sure of yourself. Sword to Boomerang! Boomerang to Sword! That was close. She's got more tricks than my brother's friend Orko. Hello, this is Optimus Solo, and welcome to the 61st chapter in our Powers of Grayskull series. With me for this journey into the Masters of the Universe franchise is, of course, the one and only ATFG1 Mike. Hello. Hello. Professionalism at its finest. Are you kidding me? I've been doing this for almost eight years now. Professionalism went out the window. That is clear. Um, are you ready for more Mists of Etheria, sir? Uh-huh. Yep. You sound excited. So in this episode of Mists of Etheria, we'll be giving you our thoughts on episode 43, Welcome Back, Cow, episode 44, The Rock People, and episode 45, Huntara. So we hope you're ready, because it's time to go back to Etheria. For a second there, I thought you were going to say, Welcome Back, Cotter. You already made that joke last episode. No, I didn't. <laughs> Did yes. I? I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> And then I dropped the gush fruit on Imp. Well, old friend, I wish I could have been there with you. Hmm. Looks like they're going to that mill. I'll zip there ahead of them. Everybody inside. I need a place to hide. I know. <laughs> We're going to take care of those machines before they can get anywhere near the village. Actually, Madam's come up with something. Now, now, I, uh, really think this is something special. Well, here, a demonstration will explain it best. Oh, dear me, my, let me see. Nizzle, nazzle, nizzle, uh, no. Power soften, ground to glue. Oh, no, madam. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think I got it. Try nizzle, nazzle, nazzle, no. Nizzle, nazzle. Oh, yes, very good. Nizzle, nazzle, nazzle, new. Power soften, ground to glue. We'll ambush the tanks at the crossroads. Madam will sink the machines into the glue from the air. Once their legs are in, Madam will harden the stuff. Sprag and Sprocker will stay here in the village to sound a warning, just in case any of the machines get past us. We thought Cow would get some rest if he had a nice place to sleep. All right, first up today is episode 43, Welcome Back, Cowl. Air date of Tuesday, November 5th, 1985, written by Philip Castle. Hordak captures Madame Raz and some rebels accuse Cowl of being guilty for Madame Raz's capture. We have Hordak, Shadow Weaver, Tongue Lasher, and Imp. And then we have She-Ra, Swiftwind, Bo, Madame Raz, Cowl, and the Twiggets. What do you think of this betrayal, who's guilty, welcome back Cowl episode? First of all, Cowl never left. It's not like he went to the Valley of the Lost or something. It's not like he, you know... He didn't pull an Orko. Because there is, and we know this, we've been doing this for four, almost five years now. In He-Man, whenever Orko got down or whatever, whenever someone accused him of something, his best choice of, of options was to run away and just leave all his friends and everything else. Cowell didn't necessarily do that here. So the whole welcome back Cowell thing, it's like, seriously, really? He didn't go anywhere. He's been in the whole episode the entire time. I could see if the Horde captured him. or you know, I think it was like, more so like a figurative of welcome back, yeah, the one we can I trust, know. and you're back but in the fold. Like they should... Yeah, I, I have lots of issues with this episode. Oh, geez, we're in for a heck of a ride then. <laughs> um, I, I don't mind the whole idea that we're uh, having an episode where 
one of the members of the good party, so to speak, is called into question. It's always interesting when they kind of flip things on their head and, and good characters are questioning good characters or are arguing with them or fighting with them, etc. I mean, we've seen it a couple of times here and there. It's not like it's totally never been done before, so it's not 100% unique, but it's not overdone. It does, it's not like we get it every three episodes. So Yeah, the problem isn't so much that it's done. It's the reaction to like the extreme reaction to it both ways, whether it's negative or positive. That's and I'll talk about that later. But that's really where where I come down on this episode where it's like, yeah, you can do that. You can explore. Oh, my God. What if Cowell betrayed the rebellion or whatever? And that's fine. But just the and that's been a problem of this show. The extreme reactions of characters, the extreme negative reactions of characters. What was it? A few episodes, a few podcasts ago, where we had an episode where uh, was it Sprague and Sprocker and whoever the hell from the Twiggets they hated something or somebody or yeah, uh, uh, what, what was it? Was the it trolls? Was, well, yeah, it was the troll episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Th- that's the problem I'm having with this show now. When they broach topics like this, or when they do something like the troll episode, where the reactions of the characters or it's like maybe it is because i haven't seen all of these episodes in 30 something years you know like seriously like like we've said the whole time we've been doing this and we're going to say it until this part of the powers of grayskull series ends neither one of us really remember a lot of these episodes so this is us first this is this is my first reaction to this and i just don't I don't even think I'm romanticizing the characters at all, really. Like, I remember certain things, but there are a lot of things I don't. And I'm sorry, some of these characters should not have that much of an visceral negative reaction to essentially what boils down to Cowell being set up. Right. I think the problem that we get, I'm not trying to forgive the episode for it necessarily, but I think the problem that we get with a situation like this is... If the premise is that one of them is going to be accused of betraying or, you know, like we had in the troll episode, the trust of a different species or whatever it is, it's they're they're going to these extreme reactions and these uh, kind of cartoon like, no pun intended, but like uh, emotional pull that we're getting from these characters. And I don't know if it's a product of the fact that we only have 25 minutes to develop it. You know what I mean? Like, if it would be better if it was, like, a two-parter, and the first part was kind of the the setup of why they don't trust them, and then the second part is the execution of how they figure out the real aspect of what's going on. But I I don't know if it's just because they feel like they have to rush it, but I agree that the reactions are very intense, and they're... I would like to think if you got this rebellion, and you're fighting the Horde, and you've had a, a number of weeks, months, and or years where you're doing this and where you're fighting alongside these people and it's very clear who the good and the bad are, there might mm-hmm. be great characters out there that are not as defined, but it's very clear that She-Ra, Bo, Glimmer, the Queen, you know, Swiftwind, Madame Raz, etc. are all good. Yeah. So you would think that if something came up and it was like, hey, so-and-so found out about our plans or whatever that the first reaction wouldn't be you're a traitor it was him it was her start pointing fingers at each other you've been through this fight together you know it's not you guys so the first reaction should be there's a spy out there or you know who's listening into our conversations or who's being a blabbermouth that type of stuff so i mean go ahead well we've already we started the series off with exploring a bad character going good and now they're trying to shoehorn in a potential even though this isn't what happened but they're trying to, in this episode what I, what I felt after I watched it was they're trying to force us to believe that Cowell who is a very good character he's always been a very good character and he always will be sure he has a lot of negative um, you know nagging opinions about certain things and certain people, especially Bo. I mean, let's face it, Cowell's not without fault. I'm just saying, in this specific episode, the way it's written and the way his character is done is just completely god-awful because it just doesn't it just doesn't seem like his character. Like I said, in the very to set up the whole series, we started off with Adora being evil. Right. And, and she went good. And now and but they had let, let like you said, they had five episodes. Right. To go through that whole transformation, like, 
you know. So, so like, either yeah. either you have to have multiple episodes or two parters or three parters to develop that or a string of things. If you're going to try to do it in one episode, you can't choose a character that is true and tested part of the good team. You, yep. you either have to use like a side character or someone that we don't see very often, an introduction maybe to a character that we aren't 100% sure of, or... What was the last episode we did the... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but the last episode we did, when we talked about the... Uh, what was it? The Spleck or the Spleen or whatever the hell, the, the Mud character. Oh, okay. Where Shadow Weaver turned the thing evil, and then she wrote talk... You know I mean? Use a character like that or something. Right, or or even like one of the ones that is not used very often. Like if you used a, I don't know, like a, not cast a spell. We've seen her a little bit too much, but you know, someone that's more on the side. If you're gonna use somebody that has been in a majority of the episodes, then you really have to set it up. There should have been like three or four different things where we would call into question, mm. like like if Broom was going at it with Cow. Or the Twiggets were having the tiff with him, and mm -hmm. he was being put down, and he was being cast aside, or he was being, you know, made to feel like he was not worth it, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have something that develops into, well, maybe it's possible that you could see his character making a mistake in that moment, or something like that. Right. But they don't do either of those things, so it's just very hard to believe the, what they try to execute here. Yeah, so, it really is. We'll get more into that, I'm sure, as we get into specific Whispering Woods and Fright Zone moments, so let's make our way there. beyond that hill. That is what we'll test the tanks on. That is better than running down a scrawny, fine dust mop. Hmm. Dust mop? That does it. We'll attack tomorrow morning. <laughs> Nova stuff feather bag indeed. It's him! Cow! Oh, I must get word to Adora. He must have heard our plans. Go to the village. Make sure that Cowl doesn't foul up our test. Right, Chief. And Imp, clean yourself up first. Uh, sure, boss. Bad a boy. Ooh. All right, we've made our way over to the Whispering Woods for the first time in this episode. And, Mike, I'll let you go first. We've talked about some things that might lead to potential issues with the episode, but were there anything about the episode that you liked? This is the first time, to my knowledge, that we've had a direct, quote-unquote, battle between Cowl and Imp. <laughs> uh, the, the whole fruit thing. Now, you know, to steal a line from Slappy Squirrel, now that's comedy. <laughs> um... I, but what I liked about it was how they kept cutting, the camera kept cutting back and forth 
where Imp is, is saying all these bad things about Kyle, and then it'll cut to Kyle saying, I don't think he really means that. You know, wh- right. whatever he said. But I just absolutely love that. Other than that, what do you got? Oh, man. Um, yeah. th- well, this is going to explain my eventual rating of the episode later on. <laughs> because we've already talked about one of the major things that's wrong with it, but there are actually a lot of things I do like about this episode. So <laughs> um, I think there's some continuation of good comedic moments between Imp and Hordak first. Um, the first time that Imp gets doused with the sticky fruit or whatever the hell it was. Uh, Goose fruit or yeah. gas fruit or something. Or other. Hordak gives him an order and then it, and Imp, clean yourself up first. <laughs> like It was just kind of funny that he was like, you're, you're dirty, you need to clean yourself up. Um, a lot of Imp moments. I liked when he became the ladder rung. Uh, <laughs> that was something I haven't seen him become before. And like you said, the Imp and Kyle storyline, why haven't they done this before? Yeah, really? Because these two characters perfectly play off of each other. Oh, absolutely. And it's just a great punch and counterpunch. Uh, whether it's action, whether it's comedy, whether it's uh, dialogue, they work really well together. So I'd like to see more of that. Um, this is not going to be the first time I reference a certain franchise that uh, rules the world right now. But... Uh, Star Wars. But was that an AT-AT walker or their version of... Uh... Yeah, that was an ad <laughs> Those looked like... It's like tanks, but they looked a lot more like walkers. The only time I really recognized it as an ad walker was when she roped the legs around it. Yeah. It's really the only time... Like I'm like, hey, where's <laughs> Luke in the X-Wing? Well, um, and then it gets... You could even go a little step further because then we see Tongue Lash or with a jetpack that reminded me of Boba Fett. <laughs> With that, yeah. And also later in this episode, when we talk about another episode of the uh, yeah. here in the podcast, we'll we'll have more. another episode, which no, I know, but I I need to be able to make the joke that I want to make <laughs> for that episode later. But I didn't think about Tongue Lash or as Boba Fett until I just now until I was talking about the AT AT Walker because my next note was him flying around with that jetpack on, and I thought that was kind of a cool touch. Um, like I said, I do like the unique ability to give us a story about the possibility of a good person being bad or betraying them not saying it's they just chose the wrong character wrong character wrong execution but i do like the idea not that it's like i said it's not something we've never seen but it's used seldomly enough that it, it work it would work if it was executed right um i like the reference that shira makes or adora makes uh to force captain adora and kind mm-hmm. of her knowledge of, of that time and, uh, hey, they brought the Welcome Back Cowl in as an actual line at the end of the episode. So <laughs> I guess that works. But uh, how about your fright zone? So, normally, so when, before we get to the fright zone, normally when I do the, the audio, getting the audio clips, mm-hmm. if I can get the title mm-hmm. into the plot clip, the, ver- the, the clip everyone just heard before we started talking about the plot and all that stuff, a- after the introduction of the podcast. Mm-hmm. So if if it's in the very beginning, I'll grab it and I'll just leave it at the like you know welcome back, Kyle, and then it'll cut to us doing our doing our thing. Because it came so late and I already grabbed the clips, I'm like I'm not going back and doing that. <laughs> it just came too damn late. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, the um... okay, so getting into the fright zone. At first, I thought. Uh... 87 Motu ripped this off, but apparently it wasn't because it, I, I misunderstood it. Okay, so you get Cowl and the whole thing of him going to sleep and whatever else. And then this mystical half face of Madame Raz shows up and calls him to come see her. Now, at first, I thought <laughs> it was going to be Shadow Weaver because I thought it was going to be Shadow Weaver in disguise the whole time. But apparently, Madame has some uh, self. Uh, self-confidence issues because she always makes mistakes now we're 40 something or is 40 43 42 i don't know we're we're 43 something that's 43 okay so well we're 43 episodes in to this series out of 93 so we got 50 episodes at the left of the show but we're just now realizing that madam has issues with the fact that she constantly makes a mistake. I mean, they've joked about it. Broom has joked about it and, and has always corrected her and everything else, but they've never really explored her emotional takeaway from always having mistakes. And I just think it was really heavy-handed 
a very heavy-handed way of trying to get Cowl out of the place where Imp is going to... Well, it just seemed like it came out of nowhere. Yeah, it just, like, that's why I initially thought it was, like, Shadow Weaver in disguise. Um, Imp sets up Cowl. Uh, we haven't brought, I haven't brought this up in a while, no. but... Gotta gotta talk about that transformation scene because Bo was right friggin' there. <laughs> they show Bo saying he'll show one of the machines he'll, he'll shut he'll slow one of the machines down, and then they immediately show and almost right next to him Adora transforming. What the hell? Yeah, it was, uh, I, I understand they were trying to say that he was already off, but it was way too quick. <laughs> so yeah, I almost no, wrote that down it, too. It was way too, he was still right there. Uh, ended up you know. Our friend is our enemy type of episode, and I just I started getting boring, and then I got really mad. Uh, I know, okay, so <laughs> I put in all Looks caps. Like oh mad. hell no! I know you. I know how you hate it when she throws the sword itself as a boomerang, and it boomerangs back. But now we have <laughs> sword to boomerang. Are you friggin' kidding me? See, that's fine yeah. if they would have done that every time. But since she's done that before without turning it into a boomerang, it makes it kind of pointless. Yeah, it's just, what do you got? I actually only have one thing, and like I said, it's going to play into the my rating a little bit. It is a major thing, but it's only one, and, and that is just this betrayal is not executed. It's just not executed well. Um, it's 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 very quick, it's very forced. The whole r- ruse to by Madame Raz to get Cowell out of there, how quickly Broom and the Twiggets turn on Cowell and believe it, it's just... It was weird. I even rewound and watched part of it again to make sure I hadn't just, like, spaced out and missed something. <laughs> and, and I hadn't. It just... I was like, I don't get it. I don't get the progression here. I know it's only 20-some minutes, but if you can't execute it, ask for a two-parter or something. I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but I, yeah, it's just... That was my biggest thing. And the PSA was about uh, it's better to try and fail than to not try at all. Yoda said it better. Do or do not. There is no try. Exactly. I'll give you that one. Yoda over Lukey. All right. Any day. We're going to take a quick break. And... Go in episode two over Lukey. Any day. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to hand out our first set of hardware for the today's episode. <laughs> no, madam. What is so urgent? Well, I've been thinking about... About... Perhaps going away. Going away? I just think my usefulness is well over with you. That's ridiculous. How can I be of any help to the rebellion when I, when I always manage to get my magic all twisted around? Ooh, madam, can't you see? It isn't what you do for us. We want you with us for what you are. At least ask some of the others what they think before you go. No, no! And I want you to promise that you won't tell anyone that we talked about this. <sighs> All right, I promise. All right, it's time to uh, hit people with things. So, any horde bats for you, Mike? To Philip Castle, Kessel, whatever his name is, for the dramatic character changes both ways in Broom, Broom specifically, on the whole judgment thing. Because, like, Seriously, that was too damn dramatic. So, uh, Horde Bat to the writer. What about you on Horde Bats? I'm giving one out to Broom and the Twiggets for... See, I can't give it to them directly because it's not their fault. Hey, that's who did it in the episode. They Uh, acted like jerks. They turned on their friend with a blink of an eye. I don't want them on my team. So, they get Horde (laughs) Bats. What about uh, Protection Swords for you? Cowl versus Imp was great. Cowl and Imp both get powers or protection swords. I can almost get on board with that, but I didn't write that down. I did write Cowl down as one of them, just because I do like how he just kind of stays true and doesn't freak out and just kind of, I mean, he holds his course and and becomes the better person for everything. Uh, I also have one for Adora, too, because she was the only one that didn't believe it at first. She was like, "Uh, guys, I don't think so. So yeah. it was the only voice of reason, so I will give her one as well. All right, we have a rating system that we have to go over. How many crystal castles are you giving this? Uh... If it wasn't for the imp cowl back and forth, mm-hmm. this would get a zero, but I'm going to give it a one and a half because Ooh. of that. I had you down for execution. 
Huh? I had you down for a one. <laughs> You're a half point off. <laughs> one and a half. Because, let, let, like we already said, the execution and the way this was written and just the way it came across is just so bad. Yeah. I I, I think I'm being somewhat nice, but I, I'd like to say that if it wasn't for the fact that the execution of the portrayal was bad, if it wasn't, if this was a two part episode where they actually developed and gave reason for Cowell to be the betrayer or they chose a different character, I think this, everything else about this episode had the potential to be a really great episode. I love the imp and Hordak dialogue. I love the imp and Cowell uh, back and forth. I love the star Wars references, of course. Um, there's references to past episodes with Force Captain Adora, so there's some continuity there. So, I mean, I think it had everything if it would have done the main part of the story better. So, But I'm going to take two points off for messing up the main part, so I'm going to land on a three. So okay. I'll give this one a three out of five. All right. All right. So time to take a quick break, and we'll be back to meet the rock people. <laughs> Next up today is episode 44, The Rock People, air date of Wednesday, November 6th, 1985, written by Larry Dottilio. The Horde and the Rebels investigate three mysterious meteors that have landed in the Valley of the Lost. The rocks turn out to be living beings from the planet Geelon, who are looking for a new home as their own is about to be destroyed. We have, get ready for this, Hordak, Catra, Scorpia, Shadow Weaver, Imp, Mantena, Grizzlord, Leech, and some Horde Troopers. And then we have Shira, Bo, Madame Rez, Kyle, Swiftwind, Broom. We have a recurring appearance from King Ago. And then, of course, we get Stondar, Granita, and Rakan, or Rokan, however they call him. The, oh, it's Rakan. Rakan, that's what I thought. The Rock People. So, what do you think about the introduction of this new race, the new species, and uh, kind of the fight to control them? I don't necessarily think it was a fight to control them. Well, it was a, I don't... It was a fight to possess whatever they were going... Well, on Hordak's part, yes, but Shira and the Rebellion didn't... You know, they just wanted them to be able to live in peace. I mean, it wasn't like they weren't out... Like, yeah, Hordak is evil. He wants to obviously control them. No, but them. it was more to get there first so that Hordak can't control them type thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of... Uh, what was it? Um... Not desertion of the Dinobots, but one of the episodes where they had to guard a meteor or <laughs> something. I don't know. So basically, what this episode is 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 Superman's home planet of Krypton is going to explode, and he needs to leave. Is essentially what this episode is. <laughs> yeah, in a way, there's a lot of things uh, that I see yeah. in this episode. But what do you what do you think about the introduction of the Rock People? I, I like it. I don't know if they're going to show up again. Um, oh, spoil it? No, not yet. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think they're cool. I think they're cool characters. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wonder and see if we have, uh, you know, if we see them more again. Because that's essentially the problem with this show. They'll introduce characters and we'll never see them again. Um, to a point. Well, okay, well, I, I'm sure, 
I'm saying characters that they've introduced before this. Yeah. You know, I mean, we what? do have King Ago showing up for the third time this episode. Well, yeah, but I, like, like you wrote down in here King Liz. Who the hell is King Liz? It was listed on IMDb as being in this episode, but I didn't see unless that. Oh, that was the. I don't even no, know what the hell the character is. No, it was the it was the big dinosaur. Oh, okay. That must have been it. Okay. Yep. Should have just wrote in there big dinosaur. <laughs> That's what they, apparently he has a name, King Liz. Um, she does refer to him as the lizard. Um, I was very much looking forward to this episode when I did the script for it because I actually had one of the Rock People action figures back when I was oh, a, really? yeah back when I was a kid. I had one of them, and then either my sister or one of my friends had the other. Mm-hmm. I was trying to look up before the episode which one I had, and I'm not a hundred percent sure which one I had. Uh, I, I looked at pictures of both of them, and they both look semi-familiar, but I haven't seen those figures in a long time. I thought I had one that was neither Stonedar or Rock on. I thought I had, like, a third one that was never in the show. Um, mm. But I'd have to look back and see how many they actually made. But they they were cool figures. I, I liked the ability to fold them up into a rock a Meteor, and... The, I think they just had a cool look to them, so I was very much looking forward to this because I didn't realize that they ever actually did show up in either of the series. Again, yeah. I had watched mainly He-Man as a kid, so they never showed up there, yet I yeah. had him you know, as a toy, and I don't even know if maybe he was packaged with He-Man characters. I'm not sure if he was packaged as a He-Man line or a She-Ra line, but um, I, I didn't realize that they actually did appear in She-Ra, so when I saw that they were going to be here, I was very excited. So I was looking forward to this episode a lot. So I'm all yeah. about the introduction of the rock people. It did give me a very much a uh, feel of the original stasis pods, I guess uh, the original, uh, they, all I could think of was beast wars when we have the stasis pods falling and then the maximals and the predacons both racing to try to get them. Um, I got a lot of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. All right. Let's uh, take a quick break and we'll get into the, the little details, the finer points of the rock people. We'll be needing more supplies soon. I'm sure the... Adora! Adora! Look out! It's... Madam. Oh. Hello, dearies. Uh, the message. Oh, dearie my. I almost forgot. Here we go. This is from our friend, Riggolo. What is it? Catra and her force squad came through Pine Town in a scavenger. They were on their way to the Valley of the Lost. No one goes there. They must be after something big. They said something about rocks from outer space. I think we should look into it. The Valley of the Lost is awfully dangerous. I know. That's why I'm going to give the job to Shira. Shira? Well, listen, Adora, don't you think she'll need some help? Brove and I had better go, too. Shira might need some magical help. Now hold it. I thought Shira and I would be alone together. I'm sure Shira will be grateful for all your help. Why don't you go on ahead? I'll have her meet you at the entrance to the valley. Cap on, dearie. We'll be there in no time. Oh, no, not that. Oh, now, now, don't worry. All right, it's time for our second trip to the Whispering Woods. Did you like anything about the rock people in the episode that they are featured in, Mike? First thing I thought of was, oh, no, it's the rock lords. (laughs) First thing I thought of. Uh, Yeah, I did. Uh, Let's see here. What did my notes say? Um... All I can think of is is the Muppet Show, but instead I wrote down mysterious traveling rocks in space. <laughs> um, even though we didn't like him last episode, Broom kind of redeemed himself. You're old enough to take care of several people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's nice to see all of the horde. Now I originally only wrote down Grizzlor, Leech, Scorpia, and. Uh, and Catra, but then we then see Mantana as well. I absolutely love that. Um, we get 
new settlers on, on Ethereum, so that's nice. And you know, hopefully, we eventually see them again. What about you? Uh, finally, the Rock People, uh, the original Stasis Pods, like I talked about. Um, Bo looking for one on one time with Shira. Uh, I mean, that's you put that in your wait. You put that in your your whispering. Woods I, well. I did because I think it's a legit. It's a realistic. Um, it's a realistic thing that you would see out of a guy in this environment. Like they would be trying to find one-on-one time with Adora or She-Ra or whatever. So I thought it was realistic, even if it's Bo being stupid. Um, I can still see him wanting to to try to find time to spend with She-Ra. Um, wow, all the horde for once. Yes, I'm echoing what you said there. I like to see them all together. They had a good moment for a commercial break when the rock people showed up. Uh, before they, It's basically right when they turn into... A, a talking, speaking, humanoid-type character. They go to commercial break. I thought that was cool. They have a flying tank in this episode. They call it the Scavenger. Uh, mm-hmm. That was interesting. And I thought it was interesting that they uh, leave most of the Horde behind when Catra tries to basically fly off without him. Um, and they, with Leech's help, they get uh, stuck back to the Scavenger to, to fly off. Apparently, the weapon of choice for the Rock people is Stiff Arms. Because uh, apparently yeah. all they do is stick their hands out and people go flying. So <laughs> I yep. don't know. That was uh, I don't know if I necessarily loved that, but it was an interesting choice that they don't. I mean, they are peaceful people and they don't like to fight. So apparently they don't have any weapons. Um, but I thought that was interesting. But my favorite part about this episode was the fact that the rock people, unlike like ninety five percent, maybe even ninety nine percent of both. He-Man and She-Ra episodes is usually we're introduced into somebody from another planet or, you know, a traveler or whatever, and by the end of the episode, they go back to their planet. By the end right. of the episode, they leave. And here, they stay on Etheria. So, yep. I like the fact, even if they never came up again, I would like the fact that I am left thinking that they're living on Etheria somewhere, and that they didn't just return to a new planet or go find somewhere else. So, I am very hopeful to see them again and i like that it leads up to that uh possibility what about uh, things you didn't like in the fright zone oh boy the fright zone so most of this has nothing to do with the plot most of this has nothing to do with the rock people at all um so bo wants to be alone with shira am i the only one who finds his disappointment creepy i i'm sorry like uh, bo's just yeah uh, Bo again, when they head off to the Valley of the Lost, uh, Madam tells him to come on, and he says, Oh, no, not that. Oh, no, not what? She didn't do anything to him, you ninny. Come on, you idiot. Did uh, you just call him a ninny? Yes, I did. <laughs> um, I wish you wouldn't do that. You are not her boyfriend, you idiot. Stop it. Please, stop. Okay, so the only other problem I have with this episode... The Horde dug them out, and that left the crater there. Uh, Don't things that normally crash into planets leave their own marks, you know, because of the science of it all? Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Um, I have a couple things. They they mentioned that they got some information from... uh, The best I could make out is the character's name was Rigolo. Uh, Who is Rigolo? And... (laughs) Why are we referring to someone we've never met before as far as giving information or, or helping us out? Like, that was weird to me. Bo? Who, who mentions this? It's, it's, it's near the beginning of the, uh, near the beginning of the episode when... A, Is it the evil horde that mentions this, though? No, it's Adora or Shira. Oh. I think it's Adora. And I just didn't understand what character she was referring to when she pulled out that name. Maybe I heard it wrong, but I, I rewound that and listened to it twice, and I could... It sounds like Rigolo. Um, Bo pulls out a bow and then immediately goes in for close combat. Yeah. Well, what was the point of pulling out your bow? What are you going to do, hit them over the head with it? Apparently. And then I didn't like that the fact that Hordak calls the Horde Troopers robots in this episode again. He does that a lot. Yeah, but I mean, for a long time we've kind of had the idea that they're more like stormtroopers. They're more like people underneath the the stuff. And when you call them robots, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So the PSA was about taking more courage not to fight and to find peaceful resolutions. Yes. 
one we've heard many, many times before. Uh, really quickly, before we get to the awards, I'm looking on the He-Man Wikia. Uh, Meteorbs, a Japanese toy line from Bandai called the Tamagoras, were released in the Masters of the Universe toy line as Meteorbs and were depicted as animals of the rock people. So apparently the rock people have pets. I like that. Uh, but I did send you a link so you could see... I'm still not sure which one I had. I think I had rock on, but... It might have been Stone Tire. <laughs> There's parts of both of them that look super familiar, so I am lost. Yeah, yeah like, like I do remember this... the little the little uh, thing that they hold that could stick in their chest or in their hand. It's like a. It almost reminds me of like a little satellite type thing, like a satellite dish <laughs> that they're holding. Yeah, in the show on the animation design for Rock On and Stone Dar, they're they're character styles and designs are two very different things yet the action figures almost look similar in specifically colors not necessarily how they're designed because let's face it all those toys back then were very very impish but um just the colors and the toys like which one is which like if i didn't have the names of them together you know i'm like wait a minute i don't i don't get this (laughs) so yeah All right, so we're going to take a break, and then we'll be back for more awards. Cap and Deary will be there in no time. Oh, no, not that. Oh, now, now, don't worry. Why would the Horde want rocks, Adora? That's what we're going to find out. We should all wait. The valley's too dangerous. Oh, piss and tosh. I'm old enough to take care of myself. You're old enough to take care of several people. If you're quite ready, Mr. Big Mouth. All right, another chance to hand out some hardware. I don't have any horde bats. So what about you? Oh, always Bo. I'm Bo? sorry. He's such an idiot in this episode. We need to have a crossover special, the Bo and Tila show. You know what they need to do? They need to just marry each other because they're per- they're the perfect couple for each other in this franchise. Uh, what about protection swords for you? I think it's obvious. I'll give some protection swords out to the Rock people um, for those magnificent stiff arms and <laughs> being peaceful and being cool and finally showing up. What about you? Uh, I can give one to Shira. Like I said, you know, her whole agreement of, of of being able to, you know, respect their opinions and all that stuff. Madam Raz and Broom. Again, I know we didn't like Broom in the previous episode of the podcast today, but my, the way they banter back, it, it's like an old married couple. I just absolutely love them. And, of course, the rock people. Oh, they excellent. were pretty cool. I, I, I'm not sure I liked, if you would like them or not. Yeah, no, I liked them. Um, I'm trying to... Th- Think. Don't hurt yourself. Stone Dar's, Stone Dar's voice. I'm sure it's 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 not Shimer. It's probably John Irwin, or it's it's somebody we've we've heard before. But I really like his voice on that. I thought I thought Stone Dar's voice was really really cool. All right. Well, let's see if my prediction is correct. How many crystal castles do you give the Rock People? Three and a half. Um, so it was close. really. <laughs> What'd you think? A four? I had three. I had three <laughs> down for you. Uh, Stone Dar was uh, George DeCenzo, by the way. George DeCenzo. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, outside of Bo's, you know, stalking of She-Ra, I just, <laughs> I, I can't, I can't not fault this episode for that because, well, I can. I'm taking two and a half points off for it, but um, 
That'd be one and a half for those that can do math. Whatever. <laughs> it's math. It sucks. Um, you know, so it's 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 just one of those things where yeah, the rock people were cool. It was an interesting plot. It was fairly well executed episode. Mm-hmm. The only you know, if you'd have put glimmer there instead of boat, would have been better. Yeah, I agree. There's just a couple of things making me not give this one a perfect score. So I'm going to be at a four out of five. So you're in a three and a half, and I'm in a four. So. Uh, pretty similar rankings for the rock people. So a good introduction to these guys. Hopefully we see them again. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with the final episode of the day. It's not Thundercats, but it is Huntara. Well, it's also in a galaxy far, far away. True. Attempts at taking Shira. What do you have to say for yourselves? What? Not one among you has an excuse? <laughs> what a bunch of wimps, huh, Bob? <laughs> I'd like to turn that big faced little snoop imp into a door knocker. I'd be glad to help you. Silence! Horde science and magic turned you into the greatest force squad ever to destroy a planet. The greatest! And yet, all of you together can't beat a single woman. Yeah, a single woman. You're all fools! Fools! Dolts! Dolts! Why can't you all be more like Imp here? He knows how to get a job done. Be more like Imp! What a depressing thought! Now, where was I? I believe you were talking about dolts. Right. Dolts! Thanks to your failures, Horde Prime is displeased. And I don't like it when the ruler of Horde World is displeased. It's time to bring in someone more competent. That's why I've contacted the planet of Silax. Silax? That's that part of the Horde Empire, is it? No. In fact, they don't really know much about us, but I know about them. Silaxians are the greatest warriors, hunters, and trappers in the universe. And I've sent for their very best to handle She-Ra for us. Ah, when did this, this outsider arrive? Today. And if she succeeds, you'll spend the rest of your time here cleaning out garbage bins with very tiny brushes. <laughs> She-Ra! Last up today is episode 45, Huntara, air date of Thursday, November 7, 1985. Also, like the rock people, written by Larry Dottilio, Hordak convinces Huntara, a strong warrioress, is that even a word, that Shira is evil and that uh, he wants her to hunt her down because apparently this race of people will hunt down evil people. That's the best kind of explanation I get for that. Uh, for Horde members, we have Hordak, Katra, Shadow Weaver, Scorpia, Imp, Leech and Grizzlor. Again, a big variety of Horde members. Members of the Rebellion, we have She-Ra, Bo, Glimmer, Cowl, and Swiftwind. And then we get a Garve, the Innkeeper we meet, and Huntara, which I believe they said she was from the planet of C- Silax. So she's a yeah. Silaxian or something like that. So yeah. what do you think about Hordak enlisting help from a warrior planet and bringing a Huntara into the picture? First of all, this should have been called Hordak's Master Plan, not Huntara. Because as soon as I saw this, and as soon as I saw Hordak fumbling around with footage of Shira, I'm like, oh my god, it's just like Starscream with an Optimus Prime costume on from Megatron's Master Plan. <laughs> Interesting. I did not pick up on that reference as I watched yeah, it. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I like the idea. I, I like the idea, again, where... 
you know, he doesn't say how far away the Salaxian planet is or anything like that, but where, because the way that it's been described to us is that Etheria and Eternia are in two very different dimensions. So what I, you know, when we were doing He-Man, we went to very, you know, we went to various planets right. and, and, and different things and everything else. So I'm curious now to see if we're going to be exploring more of the surround. I mean, I know obviously the whole thing is, you know, based on the war of theory and all that stuff, but like, I would love to see Shira and, and the rebellion have to go help somebody else on another one of Etheria's neighboring planets. As far as this episode goes, I thought it was great. I thought that the introduction, introduction of Huntara was really, really cool. I don't know if you ever... Did you ever watch Batman Beyond? No. Okay. In Batman Beyond, there is a assassin named Curare. Mm -hmm. She is essentially a part of the futuristic version of Rachel Ghoul's League of Assassins. Okay. It's, it's essentially that that's what... She's a member of some sort of assassins club, whatever. And she has... like When I first saw Huntara, I'm like, oh, hey... I know where I've seen that style before. It, it's Curare because she has, she has the mask, the the hood thing mm -hmm. over her face at first, and then she takes it off. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, the overall plot was nice. Um, I just, I, I don't know. The, the ex, the plot was nice. The execution was good, but I'm not so sure if someone as badass as Hantara is could be fooled that easily. But I mean. Hornak didn't do a very good job of lying. He just showed her footage. Hey, we foot got some footage. We got actual seeing it yeah. for your eyes. Well, that'll convince just about anybody. Like that, she sees Shira I, burning shit down. She's I, I think, I think. I mean, I'm that, not saying the uh, editing job was great by Hornak. It seemed like he never actually caught her in the act or anything like that. But yeah, I, I think Hornak has been visiting the Onion recently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the idea that Hordak has finally realized that his horde troopers are useless and that uh I, I wouldn't say that though. I don't think I don't feel like they are played up as dumb as what we get a lot of times with the Eternian uh, with the um evil warriors. You get a lot of the feel that Beastman is a bumbling idiot and that uh you know, Trapjaw and Triclops are, I mean they all have their good qualities but they never seem to get anything done. And right. you definitely get that here again. I mean, they play these guys off the same way. Catra and Scorpia are, you know, too busy tripping over each other's feet and tails and whatnot. And uh, outside of Imp, you have... We haven't really seen much as far as Grizzler do anything good, bad, or indifferent. So I like the idea that he's realizing, hey, Shira is otherworldly power, and we need to get somebody from another world to combat that. So I like the idea that he picks this one. He just probably should have picked a race that uh, dislikes good people instead of yeah. dislikes evil people. <laughs> because if I am finding a race that is known to be, or a planet that is known to be uh, this almost like uh, almost like Spartan uh, type warriors where they're just, this is what they're good at. They're good at fighting, they're good at hunting, they're good at survival and yep. if i know that they don't like evil people i don't think i'm bringing them onto my planet when i yeah. am the evil person on that planet <laughs> so i understand yeah. the desire to go get somebody else but probably not the best selection so see if if they had done something like like you're saying like instead of making huntara this person that that believes so easily that that Shira is an evil person, regardless of the false evidence against Shira. Um, like, I wish Hordak. Like, I wish they would have introduced her as Hordak, saying, "Oh, I'm I'm going to reach out to the baddest of badass bounty hunters I can," right. or you know that kind of thing, instead of doing what they did. Yeah, but that's just a minor thing as far as his, I mean, he is oh, a yeah. he is an evil warrior leader, so he is going to make dumb mistakes and dumb selections and do stuff that makes it so he doesn't win. So I will forgive him 100% for that. But if I'm in his place, I'm not bringing someone onto my planet that dislikes evil people. So that's my quip on that. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to see what good and bad we can find from Huntar. <laughs> Now we will 
we'll see if what they say about these Silaxians is true. I am Antara. Warrior of Silex. Which of you is Hordak? I am Hordak. Welcome to Etheria, Huntara. It is a great honor to... I am not here for pretty speeches. You have asked for help. I am here to give you that help. But first, you must prove to me that this She-Ra is as evil as you say. She-Ra? Evil? Uh, I thought we were the evil ones. Oh, she's evil, all right. And I've got the proof. If you'll just allow my troopers to escort you to my throne room, I'll show it to you. Very well. Let us go. How can you convince her that She-Ra is as evil as you say? I've had some false holovid pictures made. They make She-Ra look totally evil. Huntara will believe them, even if they are all lies. <laughs> All right, it's time for our last journey into the Whispering Woods today. And because I'm a gracious uh, host with the most here, I'm going to let you go first. Also, I'm going to let you go first because I have 13 things for Whispering Woods. Jeez, I have three. Okay, go for it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't dislike this episode. I, I have three good things and I have one bad thing. So it's not, I just, I'll say this now. This episode just ended up being more watchable than having to write stuff like the the whole point of us doing this and the whole point of us doing all of this that we've been doing for all these years now is that we pick apart the series we like we find the things we like we find the things we don't and because otherwise just... well let's face it like we i want to watch all these episodes i wanted to watch all the he-man episodes again all the she-ra episodes again i don't really want to watch <laughs> the adventures <laughs> but i yeah. i am curious enough that i will watch it and i have i mean i've watched all of the 2000 uh to, X, yeah. yeah, that version. Yeah. But I'm game for watching it again because it's that good. And spoiler alert on my opinions of that series. But the main thing about this was if I just was sitting down and going to watch all these, eventually I probably would stop or I'd lose interest or I would um, get bored or sidetracked or whatever. And by doing this, it's it's giving me yeah. a solid reason to actually watch all of them and, and to okay. be someone that is going to be uh, picking out the good, the bad, the recurring themes, the yeah. things about the series and the writing that we like, we don't like. So, I mean, that, that's part of the whole. But there are times where, and this is what I'm saying about this specific episode, there are times where we're just going to sit and watch it because. Yeah. There's times where like, I forget and I like look up and I'm like, oh shit, yeah. I haven't written anything down. It's like, I haven't written anything down. Uh, first of all, Huntara is a badass. Yeah. Grizzlor and Leech on commentary needs to happen every single episode. That was awesome. <laughs> Hey, look, lightsabers. Mickey Mouse is going to sue somebody. Yeah, this is our next uh, Star Wars reference for today. So we already had the Boba Fett and the AT-ATs. And uh, we even had uh, Luki giving Yoda-like advice. So now we have actual lightsabers. So, mm -hmm. What about um, you? Man. <laughs> <laughs> Where to begin, yeah, right? right? <laughs> um, the whole horde together again. And not just that they're together, but the, it's like they're getting a debrief. At the beginning of the episode where Hordak's going over, like, you guys have sucked lately. And uh, I thought that was funny. I like the name of the planet as well as the, the idea that there's this warrior planet, Silax. Uh, it sounds like a, it almost sounds maybe not more, maybe not as warrior-like and more like sci-fi. Sounds like something that would be on, like, uh, Battlestar Galactica or something. Um, I think Silax is a word on that series, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, I like the fact that we're reaching out to a different planet. Um... I like that he threatens the horde with cleaning out garbage bins with very tiny brushes. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting touch. Not just like cleaning out garbage bins or not doing peeling potatoes, but cleaning out garbage bins and then he has to add with very tiny brushes. <laughs> so basically, if the horde members don't succeed, Hordak's going to turn them into cooks and the maid staff. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> in that place, it looks filthy from the outside. Um, <laughs> right. They had some cool animation on the fire and shadows when they were um, dealing with the rebellion. There was some cool effects on uh, whether Adora or Shiro was facing the fire, or not facing the fire, and kind of how they made that shadow and and all that kind of flicker. I did not expect that voice from Huntara. 
I'll talk about that later. I did not expect that voice. But I actually liked it because it was so unexpected and because I'm so sick of hearing the typical uh, voices that we hear from Erica Scheimer and uh, either Linda Gary or Melanie Britt. So I liked that there was a difference there. Um, I think Erica Scheimer did a good job with that voice. So I know it wouldn't be for everybody because it does sound very manly. But why can't she channel that manliness when she's doing actual men voices? Is or 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 little boys? Yeah, that's what I don't get. Um, I, propaganda in a, in a kids episode here with the with the incorrect hollow images. It's this is how you use war images to, uh, I guess, further your cause. <laughs> Hordak is just yeah, using different uh, things to to promote what he wants. I thought that was an interesting uh, take. I'm on that. just waiting. And I think we already had this with a for- yeah we already had an episode with a for- where they put a force field around the Whispering Woods. But I'm just waiting for Hordak to build a wall between the Fright Zone and the Whispering Woods. That way we can make a Donald Trump reference. There we go. Um, <laughs> I, Scorpio actually had a funny moment here. Uh, as much as I don't like to agree with you, Catra, I agree with you. It was just like the timing that she <laughs> delivered that line was really good. Um, first time that we've seen whatever interesting butterfly vehicle Glimmer is piloting. At first, I thought she was inside Flood Arena. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they did have some like vehicles in the Shira toy line that I don't know if ever appeared in the show, but this reminded me of those. And yeah. I like the idea that Scorpia and Catra are actually teaming up because usually they don't necessarily see eye to eye. And I thought it was funny that Scorpia's like, I don't like Catra as Force Captain, but I won't like that other Hantara lady either. And it is <laughs> a reference to Catra as being a superior. So that's very much so been solidified in the series that Catra is a, kind of like the number two um, mm. in command that she took Adora's spot. She, how about the line, she's got more tricks than my brother's friend Orko? Yeah. I <laughs> thought that was interesting that Dottilio put that in there. I, I don't know how she would necessarily know too much about Orko, but... Uh, Are you kidding? She's met Orko. But We've I mean, seen... not to, to the point where you'd know that much about him but i thought that was a good line i like that I, I think the reason why the line's in there is because i think they communicate more than we see yeah. on the screen you know what i mean but i so, just thought it was cool it was cool to add yeah. that oh, absolutely i i absolutely loved it and so. i actually even though they are a complete ripoff of lightsabers i did like the stun swords and how they were done and there's also a very cool kind of landscape shot at the end the final shot in the animation looked really cool as they kind of pan from like a panoramic view of the landscape um so a lot of stuff to like. What about uh, what the one thing you didn't like? I'm going to let you go to Fright Zone on your own because I don't have anything. So. <laughs> okay. Like I said, and it's not really going to take away from my overall grade or anything like that, but you mentioned earlier about Huntara's voice. <laughs> it sounds like a deeper voiced version of Greedo. Han shot first. <laughs> <It's back then laughs> so it's really you a Fright Zone you? moment. It's just like, like as soon as I heard it, I'm like, Oh my god, why doesn't she have a snout and, and, and sunglasses on, on a green face here? But it's like when we see Huntara come out of that ship with the black mask on, and then mm-hmm. she takes that off, and you, you're left with this very tall, like this thing is all legs, um, very imposing, uh, you know, with the haircut and the mm-hmm. brand or the tattoo or whatever you want to call on her head, and all this different yep. stuff. You're like, okay, this is a badass looking chick. She is. And, yeah. but before she talks, I almost, hey, when you think about it, you're like, who is going to voice this? Like, what voice is going to come out of this character? Because it, it can't sound like anything else. Like, she clearly yeah. looks like her own thing and, like, way more of a badass. Almost reminds me of, uh, like, Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy or someone like that, like, imposing. The, the, uh, the other one I thought of was the, the, the bounty hunter before. Boba Fett yeah. in Clone War, and uh, not Clo- yeah, I know uh, Attack of the Cl- Attack of the Clones. Uh, what's her name? The the one that tried to kill right. Padme. Yeah, uh, her voice. Uh, yeah, have you? So I mean, I'm I, glad I, it wasn't just another typical female voice. I'm glad they did something different with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I assume you've seen Dude, Where's My Car? Right? Well, like when it came out, and never again. Okay, well, you remember that about. On one of the robots ended up being a version of the fifty foot woman. Oh yeah. Several angles of Huntara reminded me of that. She, she seemed like she could be pretty tall. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was your only moment, right? 
Yeah, that's All it. Right. So the PSA was about lies not working and that the truth always, always tell the truth. The truth always comes out in the end, so you might as well tell the truth and save yourself the trouble. So, I mean, good lessons. Um, and obviously, Hordak was lying in this episode, so there's a, a loose connection to the episode. So, uh, yeah. whatever. It's a PSA. So, all right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with our last offering of Protection Swords and Horbats. At last, the bait I have chosen for my trap leaves her nest. Now to catch her. will bring her down. tax collector should come through here. We better start planning. Uh, Adora, Adora, a, a woman came into the inn and demanded I bring you this. Demanded? Yes, she said it's for she and if she doesn't get it, Glimmer will be in great danger. Who was this woman? I've never seen her before, but I will tell you this. She made my blood run cold. Oh, thanks, Garv. We'll get this to she -Ra. I think we better take a look at this message. But if it's for Shira? If Glimmer's in danger, I don't think Shira will object. I am Antara. Listen well, Shira. I have your friend, Glimmer. This device you see is a dimensional transporter. If you do not meet me in battle by the time the sun is at its highest, I will use it to send Glimmer to a place from which she will never return. We will meet at Tomb Rock in the Crimson Waste. You must come alone. If you bring help or fail to come, Glimmer will pay the price. Defeat me, and I promise she will go free. Until we cross swords, farewell, evil one. All right, last chance today to hand out horde bats and protection swords. I am going to refrain from hitting anybody with a horde bat. I'm going to stick those back in the trophy case and save those for a rainy day. But do you have any horde bats? I'm sorry, Hordak. It just, like... I can see that. I can see that. The only... It is wrong. Because, it, yeah, he is wrong, obviously. He's wrong all the time. But it isn't even because he's lying. It's... Because he's lying, and at the same time, he wants to impress Huntara. Like, he ends up running after her. <laughs> and I'm like, all as, I, all as I was really waiting for when he runs after her, I was waiting for the animators to put little hearts above his head or something. Right. I could have seen that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so uh, Horde Band for Hordak? Yeah. Any protection swords? Shira and Huntara. Uh, Huntara just for being a badass, regardless <laughs> of whether she was tricked into, you know, fighting Shira or not. But just the whole battle, everything with the two of them, absolutely awesome. I will echo the Huntara part. I'm going to give her a protection sword. Like you said, she's a badass. And I'm going to say it now so that maybe it'll make me do it. But when we're done with uh, the filmation aspect yes. of this franchise, I have to put a blog together where... I rank the top 10 villains that are not part of the Horde or the Evil Warriors. Yeah. And Huntara is going to be near the top so far. Yeah, that's up. Yeah. So, I mean, we've seen a couple cool ones that I wish we would have saw more of. And Huntara is one of those that I wish we would see again, even though I'm 99.9% .9 sure we're never going to see her again. So, yeah. All right. As far as Crystal Castles go, what do you have? Uh, I'm going to give it a three out of five three. because. Yeah, it's not that it's a middle ground episode, but it's just only because of the way Hordak was and just all that stuff with Hordak, just like, Hordak, come on. Hmm. This, I'm you? disappointed in your score. I, had, <laughs> I predicted you at a four. And <laughs> giving me a three, and I actually gave it a five. 
So there you go. Five out of five for me. I enjoyed this episode. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it was because I'm on a high. Because like we started <laughs> with uh, we started with Welcome Back, Kyle, which was whatever. I gave it you know a, a three. It was a forgettable episode. But then we had the Rock people, so I was ready to go. I gave that one a four. Huntara, I'm giving a five. Like I, I enjoyed today's episodes for the most part, with the minor exception at the beginning. So uh, five out of five. I couldn't find anything. I had no fright zone moments. I couldn't find anything. I mean, I guess Hordak chose bad to pick someone that hates evil, but that's what bad guys do is they have a flaw in their plan. So I can, mm-hmm. I'm not going to fault it for that. So, <laughs> all right, we'll take a quick break and Mike will be back with some final thoughts. Do you like retro cartoons? Then Saturday Morning Rewind is the podcast for you. Join them each month as they talk about classic cartoons and interview legendary voice actors like Jim Cummings. I am the terror that flaps in the night. Corey Burton. Mm-hmm. Sometimes toys can be so funny. Rob Paulson. Sure, Blaine, but how are we going to find chaps our size? Nancy Cartwright and many more. Eat my shorts. So grab a bowl of Lucky Charms. The match is delicious. Put on your hammer pants. Go to SaturdayMorningRewind.com. And be prepared to feel like a kid again. Once again, that's SaturdayMorningRewind.com. Saturday Morning Rewind was voted best podcast ever by its host, Tim Nidell. So it's got to be good. All right, folks, we are back here on Mist of Etheria. And before we close out the show, I want to bring up something that I noticed. Oh. Um, since our inception way back when, technically we've been doing reviews for four years, but the episode zero actually released in 2011. So technically we've been doing the show overall five years. Um, but in the four years, what I noticed on iTunes is that we get essentially one new iTunes review a year. (laughs) We got one? Uh, yeah, uh, it was about, well, uh, I don't have iTunes anymore, so I can't view it. So it was months and months ago. It was back in March because by the time this episode airs, it'll be close to August. So we're a little behind on this. Uh, and the only reason why we're not releasing episodes until we do is so we can line it up with the Christmas special to close out and do the finale for the for the Shira series. So uh, I do want to give a shout out to all of the the six uh, iTunes reviews that we do have. Uh, Super Tim twenty five left us a review back in twenty twelve. So did Cast twenty three twenty three. Uh, 2013 was Jedi JP. Um, all of these are good reviews. So uh, Cosmic Psycho is another great fan of ours as well. Waltor 3 loves this as well. The new review by Mega Gear Max was left on March 6th, 2016. GCRN has the power. Five star review. I love the thoughtful analysis of these. Fifth. Thoughtful analysis that these guys give for the old Filmation stuff. Filmation Motu is nostalgic, but like them, I now view it with older eyes rather than be blinded by its nostalgia. One of my biggest criticisms about Filmation Motu, which the GCR and crew address at times, is the lack of appearances of other toy line characters, their backstories, their development, as well as continuity. However, the cartoon had heart and the reviewers provide new insights that suggest Filmation Motu might not be as corny as the stereotypically as it is stereotypically seen. Characters that I was once initially dismissive towards are now seen with a new light. Keep it up. I can't wait till you guys get to new adventures and especially 2000X. Thank you so much to Mega Gear Max. Yeah, we are we're both at this point dreading new adventures. I'm not dreading it um, because I'm it's it's. Here's the situation with that. I'm, I view it as this, okay? It's not like you're going to see a movie that you think is going to be good and it's going to end up being bad. You're going <laughs> in expecting it to be awful, so it's like Mystery Science Theater 3000 type stuff. Like, <laughs> I'm just expecting to have some fun and, and to get violently uh, aggressive with my rants. And uh, that, that's a fun time. Ladies and gentlemen, Optimus Solo of the GeekCast Radio Network just compared... The awesomeness that is Mystery Science Three, you know, like the times. movies they're it's reviewing. The awesomeness that is New Adventures of he Man. Not the actual show and the banter, but it's like I know I'm going to be watching a terrible movie right, while yeah. doing something else. So, yeah. um, 
anything we want to bring up before I close out? Any, any final, any, any uh, predictions or anything you want to bring up for the next few episodes? I don't have predictions based on the titles coming up, but uh, I do say that I like that we saw the rock people. I'm hoping that we get to see them again. I was expecting nothing out of Huntara. I had no clue what it would be, and I loved that episode. So I'm hoping this uh, this high rating continue into the future as we make our way into the we're at, we're right about at the halfway point. Yep, pretty much. Well, I mean, we're almost we're we're two thirds of the way through first season, but halfway through the entire series. About yeah, because we had episode forty three, and there was only ninety three episodes. So yep. next episode will right. be the halfway point. Yep. Thank you for listening to Myths of Etheria. If you'd like to get in contact with us or leave feedback for the show, there are several ways to do so. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com, where you can comment on this and all of our other episode posts. Email us, feedback at geekcastradio.com. Leave the show's feedback in iTunes. Please do this. We do pay attention, or at least I pay attention to the iTunes reviews, because uh, I just can't help myself. Um, follow us on Twitter, at Geekcast Radio is the network Twitter. You can follow at Pow of Grayskull for all the uh, podcast updates as well. Mine is TFG and Mike. What is your Twitter? At Optimus Solo. Become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast or radio network. We hope you enjoyed the myths today, and don't forget to join us for our next episode when we take a look at the next three episodes of the show, Micah of Bright Moon, The Price of Power. Didn't we already watch that one? No. The, oh, The Price of Freedom. That's what it was. Uh, and finally, Birds of a Feather Flock Together. For now, I am TFG and Mike with... To Miss Solo. By the power and for the honor of Grayskull, you all have the power. I know,